Hi, Newtone started putting cassette players in intercom master stations with the model 2542, which is a fairly rare model that most people have never seen. It's really nice. Then after that, we had the 313 series and it had a cassette player in it. And the most common model that you see with a cassette player in today's world is an IM or an IMA 4006. Cassette players were standard in those models. It was the top of the line of the day and it came out in 1986 and cassette that's where still all the thing. Cassette players are primarily a mechanical device and they're driven by a motor and belts. And the motor turns on, spins the belt, moves the gears and cogs and wheels and other things inside of it, tape goes around and strangely enough music comes out. Over time the belts will fail. They fail either because they just get dried out and they lose their stretchiness. This is a used one. It doesn't have much stretchiness left in it anymore and they'll break and when they break what can happen sometimes is we'll open up this nasty little bag right here. They can wind around the pulley that fits onto the motor shaft right there. It has two grooves in it. it. Presses down onto the output shaft of the motor right there. And that's what turns the belts. And sometimes when the belts break and the cassette player is still running, the belt will wind itself around the pulley and around the motor output shaft and bind it up. So the motor will still be turned on, but it's the belt all wound around it and it can't spin any longer. The other thing that can happen to belts with age is they begin to disintegrate and they turn into, I'm gonna put this back in here, this black gooey tar stuff that gets on everything and it's really nasty and horrible. So we're gonna close this up and now I can take the gloves off because I hate getting that black stuff on my hands. We buy a lot of replacement motors for the cassette decks in 4006s because I would say on an average probably 35 or 40 percent of the sets that come through here for repair they have bad motors. The motors won't spin anymore or they won't keep proper speed or 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 whatever's wrong with them. The other thing that can happen is this is the sort of the audio power supply board for the cassette player. This gets mounted onto the back of it. If you look really carefully you can see once it focuses, let's see if I can turn it around so you can see, this cable right here with the red, white, and blue wires is plugged into its socket right here. And if you look really carefully down right in here, you'll see that the back side of the plug and socket, which is normally brown, is turned black. And the reason it's turned black is this right here is a transistor and this is part of the power supply circuit for the motor and the cassette deck. And when motors like this get belts wrapped around the pulley and they can't spin any longer but they're still turned on, they use a lot of extra current, more power than this was designed to easily handle. This transistor gets super, super, super hot. And because of the way this is assembled, this is normally sort of sitting right up next to the brown socket. This one actually has been pried away at some point. I think it was to see if I could get the plug out of the socket and I couldn't, so the board was replaced. But this transistor will get super hot. It'll melt the plug and socket assembly here. Then the transistor fails and the whole thing goes dead. So that's another common problem that you have to deal with when you fix these. Because we buy a lot of motors like this, there's all, and they're new, you can still buy them new if you know where to get them. Every once in a while, out of the normal order that we'll place of a couple dozen at a time, you'll have over time a few of them that either don't work new or will fail at some premature point after they've been put into a customer's cassette deck, which is a real pain for us, but that's the way the world works, and they have to be replaced. This happens to be a failed one. You can tell it's failed because it's got the ominous red dot on the front of it. That's the way I mark things to know that they're bad so it doesn't get jumbled back into the pile of good ones. I thought I would take a minute today. We'll do a sort of dissection of a cassette motor because this is something most people have never seen. Some of you might wonder, well, if you buy these two dozen at a time and you have some bad ones when the order comes in, and you don't always know they're bad right off because when you buy a lot of these, you know, they get them 
put into a tub at the sh here at the shop and you don't go take one out until you need it so you don't know until you hook it up sometimes it's bad do we send them back do we get credit for them does the vendor who sold them to us feel really bad and make it up to it somehow or another no not usually let's take a quick look at this so this is the front of the motor this is the output shaft that's the part that spins the red dot means it's bad and on the back side You've got a little circuit board that sticks out here. This is where the wires get attached when you put it in a cassette player. You've got a back cover and you've got a little access port right here. That is where you stick a really, really tiny screwdriver to adjust the speed. Cassette player motors are speed controlled motors. And if we take the cover off, take the cover off like that, there is actually a gasket that sits in the back here. I think it's primarily to, it's for noise dampening and it's to keep dirt and dust and stuff out of the motor because this is somewhat of a more precision motor than what people would imagine. So we'll take the gasket and put that aside. And then here on the back, you have a little sort of round circuit board. It's a little bit bigger than a quarter, but it's not huge. This is not very big altogether. This is the motor speed control board because in a cassette player, the motor has to run at the correct and constant speed. Otherwise, when you listen to Van Halen 84, it's going to sound all weird and you don't want that. It has to run at the right speed. I think what's wrong with this one is it doesn't run at all and I, speak, I think the speed control board is bad. So we're going to take a second here and see if we can take the board out and I'll show you what's on it. It's got two blobby solder points, one there. Oh, blobby is an industry term, by the way. And that one, and we're not gonna be super fancy about this. I could fire up the desoldering tool, but I don't really feel like it. All right, so we'll take that out. And see, that was soldered onto two points one here and one here that probably that feed down into the windings of the motor but for the time being let's take a look at our speed control board on our motor speed control board we only have a total of one two three four five six parts we have a little trim pot here which is the speed adjustment we've got a couple resistors three it looks like this one the green one the coating on the resistor is kind of chipped off and i don't know whether that's because something happened and caused it to fail or whether it's just like that because they put it together over here we have a little tiny capacitor and right here we have what to most people would look like a transistor but it's not it's really an integrated circuit it's an ic model an6651 which is a panasonic part and surprisingly enough it's a motor control circuit it's an ic designed for rotating speed control of compact dc motors used in tape recorders record players etc so it's a purpose-built part comes from panasonic and it's in here because this is its job. It's a motor speed control IC. So there's not a lot wrong with this. The little trim pot is what you access through the port on the back of the cover. And of course, when this is in place, you've got the foam seal. So you need a little tiny jeweler screwdriver and you gotta stab it through the foam seal to get through it to find the slot here and then go ee, 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 and adjust it to get the right speed. How do you adjust the speed on a cassette player? Well, you have a speed adjustment tape, which I happen to have one right here. This is a precision speed adjustment tape for a cassette player. On this tape, this was recorded on a precision pre-calibrated cassette deck uh, no, I did not make this. There's a, there's a fella in England that has things like this, and you can order it from him. This has a 3,000 hertz sine wave on it. It's 3,000 hertz plus or minus 0.3%. It's special enough that it actually has its own serial number for the tape. You put this in the cassette player, you hook up an oscilloscope, and you, you play the tape, and you, the oscilloscope will show the sine wave and... If you have a frequency counter on your oscilloscope or a separate one, it'll tell you the frequency that's being fed out of the cassette deck. 
and if it's not 3000 hertz then you adjust the speed control pot to achieve the 3000 hertz and yes we do check every single cassette deck with this to make sure it's running at the right speed because again Van Halen 84 it sounds all wrong if it's running at 2.85 or 3.12 you just know it's wrong I've been listening to that tape since it came out in 1984 and I do know what those songs sound like so that's the little speed control board I'm not sure exactly what's wrong with it any one of these parts could be bad or it could be the motor itself I don't really know and I'm not really going to spend the time to find out as for the motor itself see if I can do this and keep my big hands out of the way this should come out the little plastic end cap kind of thing like that and see indeed it has on the inside it's got two sets of wipers there's one set here and one set here this one's got three fingers on it and this other one has three fingers also and they travel over to and are soldered on to the pieces that go on this side where the speed control board was soldered on and these are very springy and when you reassemble this they touch the little tiny commutator that's down inside this motor is made like most motors are made you have windings and a commutator and magnets and so forth and if we're careful we should be able to slide this out. Be nice if you could see that too. Like this. There we go. So inside, you can see down in the bottom, there's a little brass bushing that the motor spindle spins on. And then you've got a ferrite magnet. And yes, it is magnetic. See, it won't quite hold on to the screwdriver maybe a bigger screwdriver see it's magnetic and I don't think we can get that out of there it looks like it's kind of a press fit I suppose we could look and see but it seems doubtful if I had some kind of fancy hook arrangement I might be able to pry it out but I don't think it's going to come out willingly on its own it could also have some type of adhesive so i've spent enough time on that now so here's the actual windings of the motor and it's pretty much exactly like what you would expect the commutator on the back end of the output shaft right here has three sections to it so here's the back of the output shaft and this larger diameter part around here is the commutator and there are three plates one two and three on this side and they're each individual there's a gap between each plate and those are the ones that the wipers touch up against and that's how the electricity gets into the motor that's why you need the springy wipers that push up against this so it pushes up against it hard enough to let the electricity in but not so much that it impedes the spinning of the interior part of the motor this is the part that spins and you've got your three contact points and you have your three sets of windings and that's pretty much it it's just a little tiny motor but there's a lot that goes into something like this to make it very long lasting if it wasn't for the problem with you get the occasional electronic failure which is not that common so you know it's bound to happen sooner or later but if it wasn't for the broken belt problem a motor like this in theory with regular use probably would last almost forever so that's it that's what's inside your typical dc speed controlled motor inside your cassette deck and it doesn't make much difference whether it's a 4006 or a 5006 or a 313 or a 2542 they all have motors that are similar to these the older decks the ones in the 2542s the motors are somewhat larger and I think that's primarily because they have more torque. The ones in the 313s, not quite as big as the ones in the 2542s. These are a fairly typical size for the mid 80s through 90s. The one in the 5006 is actually a little bit larger than this because that's an auto reverse deck. 
and I think it has, the way it's designed, you need more torque to spin all the gears, wheels, and cogs, and things like that. These type of motors, you know, I'm not, I don't know exactly when cassette players came out, but I do know that most turntables, even if you go all the way back to the beginning of turntables, which would be in the 1950s, better quality ones, they all have DC motors too. They will be much larger than this. They can easily be three times the size, but same basic idea. That's pretty much it. That's what it is. It's a really small but important part that makes your cassette player play. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps helpful. If you did, give it a thumbs up because that helps us just a little bit. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell, and when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.